Hello, my name's Keith Davis and I'm based at the University of Hertfordshire. The talk I'm about to present was first given at the European Society of Nematology in 2016. And what I've done is I've cherry-picked a certain number of aspects of my last 25 years research into biocontrol. And then what I'll do is um, extemporize on that and then look at the future. What I'm going to do is to recount some 25 years research and um, I'm going to start with an anecdote going back to 1990, which was to my first um, large International Nematology Congress. And what I'm uh, going to do is, I'd given a talk at that particular meeting and was feeling fairly proud of myself uh, when along came Fred Homers, one of the organisers of this meeting, and uh, he sidled up to me in the bar and said, uh, you know, I, I quite like that talk that you gave, but I don't think there's any chance whatsoever that bio control is ever going to work. However, uh, what you've been talking about is an interaction between Pasteuria penetrans and a nematode, and I think that will teach us a lot about nematodes. And it was in that context that suddenly from feeling fairly happy that I'd got through my talk, that I felt fairly crestfallen that uh, my research was not going to yield what I was aiming for, which was a new strategy to control plant parasitic nematodes. For those of you who've not come across plant parasitic nematodes before, I thought I'd go through a fairly generalized life cycle so that um, the people uh, who don't know about nematodes know what I'm talking about. So basically, the first image here is of some eggs. These can either be uh, um, laid individually, or more often than not, they actually appear um, in a cyst and are clumped together. But what happens is that the uh, juvenile, which you can see is wound up within those eggs, uh, will start to hatch. And the, the, the juvenile itself is less than a millimeter long, and it starts making its way from the eggshell through to the plant root. And here what you see, depending on the nematode uh, and the species of the nematode, either they can enter the root, which is what we've got there with the uh, one stained in red, which is acid fusion, you can see that they enter the root and the root starts to gall. Some nematodes, though, don't enter the root and indeed just feed on the surface. And that's what you see at the bottom right-hand corner there. Um, if the nematodes, the nematodes themselves have a very... Um, how shall we put it, um, various, various modes of reproduction. Uh, some of them are asexual in which the, the males are redundant, but if they're sexual, uh, we go through a mating phase, and this is C. elegans mating on a, a plate of, uh, of E. coli bacteria, uh, and then once mated, um, the, the nematode starts to uh, become an adult, and here on plant parasitic nematodes, we see on the top, top left-hand side uh, cysts protruding from um, potato roots. On the one below, again stained in asinfusion, is a root knot nematode where we can see the nematode feeding on a feeding site next to the steel, but the plant root has swelled up uh, by the side of it and around it, with the gelatinous egg matrix being secreted into the soil uh, around the plant root. So what we can see in the next slide um, is a heavily infested uh, root of tomato uh, that is infested by root knot nematodes. These are probably the most economically important um, plant parasitic nematode and cause huge, huge amounts of damage. And what you can see there is that the root is terribly galled and indeed the root's unable to take up water and nutrients in an efficient and uh, timely manner. And that has a huge effect both on plant growth and on ultimate yield. What I want to do now is go back in time a few years uh, to discuss uh, the beginnings of what um, basically are, are the ground and the foundations of the biological control of plant parasitic nematodes. And this happened, uh, goes back to the Second World War, where a lot of land was put into use to grow cereals um, during the Second World War, where 
the UK had to become um, food secure. And what uh, that early work showed was that they were trying to produce cereals, and they used to monocrop cereals, and they brought a whole series of land into uh, cultivation that hadn't hitherto been used. And for the first few years, they got a certain amount of yield, but then slowly, over the third, fourth, fifth year, the yields used to plummet, and it was found that this was due to plant parasitic nematodes. So the graph I'm showing you now is some work that came out and was done between 19... 1955 and the late 60s, uh, where um, plant parasitic nematodes were monitored um, in relation to uh, cereal yield. And what uh, this graph shows, if you look at the uh, histogram on the bottom, there are a couple of different nutrient levels, but you don't need to worry about that. The histogram at the bottom shows that the yields in 1955 and 1956 were fine, but then in 57, 58, the yields really went down a lot. But then if you kept monocropping, in this case oats, and then through to barley, and you kept monocropping, uh, the yields slowly recovered again over time. But what you see with the nematodes is where the nematode numbers were very high, the yields were very low. But during that time of recovery, from, if you like, 1958, 59 through to 68, um, what happens is that the yields recover and there is a fall in the number of serial cyst nematodes. And work done at Rothamsted Research uh, by Brian Kelly, Kerry and colleagues showed that this uh, reduction in serial cyst nematode was partly due uh, to microbial enemies, natural enemies of the nematode, that were controlling their populations. And this, if you like, is the first uh, demonstration of microbial control and the development of nematode-suppressive soils. I started this uh, talk uh, recounting an anecdote where Fred Homers, uh, a Dutch nematologist, came up to me. Uh, and the talk I'd given was about a bacterial uh, spore parasite of nematodes called Pasteuria penetrans. And indeed, what I'll do is just briefly go through the life cycle as it was then known uh, back in um, 1990. So what we have are spores in the soil uh, that are there. They're non-motile. But when a nematode migrating past them bumps into them, they stick to the nematode cuticle. Nothing then much happens until the nematode enters the roots and starts feeding. At that point, uh, they put down a germination peg and what was then thought back in uh, 1977 when Sayer and Verge pub first published this wo work, uh, they showed these various vegetative microcolonies that they thought proliferated throughout the nematode pseudocelum. And what happened is that while they were proliferating, the reproductive part of the nematode was digested um, and to the point where the nematode, rather than producing 500 eggs, produced five eggs or thereabouts. Uh, at some point when nutrients became limiting to the bacteria itself, it underwent fragmentation and sporogenesis. And these then uh, built up in the female, and when the female died, uh, she would break open, the cadaver would break open, releasing the spores back into the soil, where they would be uh, waiting for another motile juvenile to come along and uh, bump into them yet again. When I arrived at Rothamsted in 1986, um, I started working on the plot that my then boss, Brian Kerry, had been working on, uh, and where he'd come up with the, th the, um, the theory that, in fact, fungal egg parasites were in indeed controlling these nematodes. And at one study, I went back to his plots and started looking at nematodes. And uh, the image that you see before you now is indeed... Um, the second stage juvenile of Heterodra avini, and there, right in the middle of the cuticle, you can see the telltale sign of a bacterial endospore sticking to the nematode cuticle. So, having seen this spore adhering to the cuticle, um, I started looking uh, for the rest of that growing season to see if we could find any females uh, that were indeed being infected following the life cycle that. Uh, was previous in the literature that had been um, 
uh, elucidated by Sayer and Vergin back in 1977. However, uh, I didn't find any. And what I decided to do was that the following year, I would go back and systematically follow the life cycle through um, the whole growing season. So what I'm now going to do is, is talk you through uh, the next year's growing season. And the graph you see you before you is um, the data that we collected in May the following year. And what you can see along the x-axis of this um, histogram is basically the developmental stage of the nematode. So we start with the second stage juvenile, third stage juvenile, adult male, and adult female. And there on the y-axis, you can see the number of hetero heterodera avini cysts per gram of root. And you can see that in May, uh, we have just short of 30 um, cysts per gram of root. And indeed, some of them, uh, marked by the brownie red histogram, had indeed got second stage juveniles encumbered with pasteuria spores. And there was no evidence of any fungal infection, either in the third stage juvenile, the male or the female. Uh, so if we then go on to the next slide. So on that slide, you can just see that I've collapsed down uh, the data for May. And if we then move on, you'll see that June, uh, we have um, the same data was collected, but you'll see that the J2s that were there in May have all grown and started to develop. And you'll see um, small numbers of J3s, somewhere about six or seven of them per gram of root. Uh, adult males are just over 10. And females themselves, there were over 20 per gram of root. And you see there that the uh, second stage juveniles, some of them still had um, pasteuria endospores adhering to them. But at no other stage during either the J3, the male or the female, can we see any evidence of pasteuria infection. What we do see in June, though, is that um, fungal infection uh, has started to creep into the female, and that's represented by the green bar uh, at the end. Moving on, what you see in July is that the numbers of J2s and J3s has practically diminished back to zero, uh, those J2s that are there, there are still some with Pasteuria adhering to them, but no evidence of Pasteuria either in the J3, the adult male, or the female. You can see that the number of females has come down from over 20, it's now around 15 per gram of root, and indeed the number of fungal infected females is around three or four. Uh, moving on to August, again the females have come down, um, and that is mainly due to this infection by uh, nematode-infecting fungi that are there uh, parasitizing the female. But there's no evidence of Pasteuria on any of the stages. And this was very frustrating, as you can imagine. I was clearly feeling very frustrated, and I have to admit that this was around the same time that my daughter was born. Um, and I had been suffering from a lot of sleepless nights and one day I came into the lab uh, and was looking at the nematode, uh, not dissimilar to the one you can see here. This is the head of Heterodra avini with the telltale sign of a Pasteuria speaking, um, sticking to it. Um, at the time, my uh, lab assistant came in and um, accidentally dropped a flask right behind me. And suddenly, uh, from looking down the microscope, I catapulted myself up like a jack-in-a-box and uh, suddenly realized that, um, Keith, you're fairly stressed at the moment, uh, not to mention frustrated because I wasn't finding out where this life cycle was. And uh, although my lab assistant hadn't dropped this on purpose, um, I was feeling um, somewhat rather aggrieved. So um, in pure anger, I picked up my pencil and I laid it on the cover slip in front of me and I pushed down on this poor individual juvenile with the spore sticking to it. And lo and behold, uh, the cover slit broke, and indeed, as did the juvenile beneath it. But what suddenly happened was that all these developmental stages of Pasteuria that um, I was hoping to see in the developing nematode on the plant roots were actually going through their life cycle in the second stage juvenile. And indeed, um, thereafter, uh, you can see here another head of um, Heterodravini, 
and on it you can see, or within the pseudocelome of the pharyngeal area, you can see spores beginning to form within the pseudocelomic cavity. And indeed, if you followed that through the season, uh, the whole second stage juvenile is indeed full of spores. What I want to do now um, is jump forward to the uh, early 2000s. And indeed, um, I got um, a, a grant to go over and visit uh, Charlie Opperman and David Bird's lab in North Carolina. And um, this is just the bell tower at North Carolina State University in Raleigh. Charlie um, had previously been visiting Rothamsted as a Rothamsted Research Fellow and had been uh, brought on board uh, at Rothamsted to implement a genomics program in plant parasitic nematodes. And we had various discussions there. And the idea being that when I would go over to North Carolina, we would start having a go at sequencing the genome of Pasteuria penetrans. We'd um, done some sequencing and had got about 2.5 megabases of sequence. And uh, we started looking at these in detail. And we were able to uh, do a multi-locus um, phylogenetic tree uh, based on 27 full-length genes. And what you can see here is the basis of that phylogenetic tree. And at the bottom, those are your gram-negative bacteria um, based on these 27 uh, full-length genes that we did. And um, above it are indeed the gram-positive bacteria, including right at the top there, the bacillus, including bacillus anthracis, bacillus succulis, uh, and other uh, closely related bacillus groups. And what you can see is that when we compared this with our Pasteuria sequences, you can see that Pasteuria was uh, very closely related to these bacillus groups of uh, gram-positive bacteria. During the early part of the 2000s, um, a lot of effort had been put into sequencing various groups of uh, bacteria, including uh, Bacillus anthracis, Bacillus cirrus, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, and so on and so forth. And indeed, uh, one of the better papers that came out and was published in 2011 in PANS was by a group um, in Sheffield that were looking at detail on the endospore of Bacillus um, cirrus. And what you can see here is you can see the honeycomb hexagonal-like uh, pattern of the endospore, uh, and that on the surface of this endospore, there are a whole series of fine filaments, uh, which turned out to be collagen molecules. And indeed, um, this was very instructive, because when we look back at some of the sequencing we'd done from North Carolina, we also started finding some collagen-like molecules. So with this similarity between Pasteuria and other firmicutes, uh, particularly Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, we started um, a PhD student, uh, Aroe Srivastava, who's been working with me for the past few years and recently got her PhD. And what she's uh, dramatically pointing at here are a whole series of selected genes from the spore coat of um, Bacillus uh, species, and seeing, their, uh, seeing whether they are present or absent uh, across a number of bacillus. And what we've got here, you see that a whole group of them, which are the animal parasitic bacillus, bacillus cirrus, bacillus thuringiensis, and bacillus anthracis, have a huge proportion of these spore coat proteins, or spore coat genes, are present. Whereas the non-parasitic bacillus, Bacillus subtilis and Bacillus lycoformis, have a lot of them uh, absent. Uh, the blue being uh, very little uh, presence, zero, and the red being highly present, so 100% of the strains are occurring there. If we then move on, um, where are we in terms of understanding uh, the attachment of Pasteuria? So where are we today? in understanding how an endospore of Pasteuria adheres to a nematode cuticle. What we can see is indeed that there's this intimate relationship between 
the exosporium and the perisporal fibers of the, nem of the spore with the nematocuticle. And if we look at that in detail, what we see is that these collagen-like fibers are present there, interacting in some way of the with the nematode cuticle. Looking at that, the cuticle in more detail, you'll see that a scanning electron micrograph shows that there is this fuzzy image, which if we look even with the TEM down below, which is on heterogryglycines, uh, you see it's full of, if you like, fibrous-like uh, interactions there. So looking across at the uh, endospore coat, we see this skirt that goes round the uh, central body of the spore, and indeed there are full of fibres. And you'll see that on the upper surface there are fibres, and indeed Pasteuric can in fact stick upside down. But those fibres are there, but much denser across this lower layer, which interacts with the nematocuticle. So what we have is, uh, what I proposed back in 2009, is that we have indeed a Velcro-like attachment system where collagen fibres on the surface of the endospore are interacting with some fibrous-like content of, of the nematode cuticle. Okay, um, I now want to stand back a little bit, and you'll remember at the beginning of this talk, I talked about Fred Homas saying that Pasteur will teach us a lot about nematodes. Um, that's still with me, but what I want to do is to just give a small, a small example of another system, and this is a system of Arthobotrys oligospora, which forms traps uh, against a nematode. And like Pasteuria, where we started sequencing the genome, people have also been looking at the genome of Arthobotrys. And indeed, if we look at that in detail, what you see is that um, certain numbers of genes are associated with different parts of the life cycle. You'll see that after one hour uh, of an interaction between uh, the fungus, as it is in this case, and the nematode, uh, you get genes that are involved in adhesion being expressed, followed by those of penetration, digestion, and so on and so forth. And um, what we can do is that Perhaps this is showing some light on the sorts of interactions that microbes have in general with plant parasitic nematodes. And so um, there are a number of groups of different genes involved. We come across uh, serine proteases, sutilins, toxic metabolites, etc. But one of the big ones that has been shown is in fact uh, this thing called ascaricides. Now, ascaricides were first developed back in the, I think it was the 1930s, a long, long time ago, where they found that if you um, slough off the surface cuticle of a nematode and poured it onto a culture of Arthobotrys, they started developing these trapping structures. And these trapping structures, uh, very little has been uh, done with them, apart from the fact that these ascaricides were called nemin elicitors because they elicited the fungus to produce these traps. What's interesting is that some work done by Paul Sternbergs and colleagues at Caltech um, in California has shown that these ascaricides are in fact involved in the nematode plant interaction. And indeed, a publication that was put out in um, July 2015 showed that these conserved nematode signaling molecules can elicit plant defenses. So not only are they turning on the ability of fungi to trap nematodes, but these same uh, compounds are involved in the nematode plant interaction. Okay, so, so far, um, we've been talking about uh, science and evidence that is there uh, and is clearly within the reality of uh, today's crop protection scientists. However, what I want to do now is in, to in, indulge in a little bit of crystal ball gazing uh, and to see uh, and speculate a little bit about where the future uh, might lead. And the person I want to bring into this is Craig Venter of the Venter Institute, who was the first person to synthesize a synthetic genome. And uh, in a recent paper published in 2016, uh, one of his abiding academic interests is how small can a bacterial genome be um, in order to have a viable bacteria. And um, 
the actual number of genes needed is, is not, um, it's a bit difficult to tell, but it's somewhere between 350 and 450 genes are necessary to produce a viable bacteria. Another of Craig Venter's abiding interests is indeed synthetic biology. And what he is coming up with is the thought that from a minimal genome, and knowing what that means, is that you can then start designing the bacteria that you want. And indeed, um, he's actually got a website where you can design your synthetic organism. You can start with what sort of the organism you want, whether it's a bacteria, a virus, a fungus or whatever, the sort of cell membrane you want, gram-positive, gram-negative, the reproductive mode of that bacterium, uh, the form of metabolism, and so on. And by having these various cassettes, uh, what he believes is you can build up a synthetic organism that will do particular jobs. And indeed, uh, looking onto this, he sees that uh, the evolution of life on Earth uh, we are at the threshold, if you like, between uh, natural evolutionary diversity and the start of synthetic evolutionary diversity. And he believes that um, in the future there will be parts of the tree of life that uh, humans will synthetically create. So we have Craig Venter and his concept of a future full of uh, synthetic evolutionary diversity um, what I want to do is, is take that and I want to undertake a thought experiment. So far within biocontrol of nematodes, we haven't been able to develop a commercial biocontrol agent which can be applied at the field level and control nematodes. So if we take Craig Venter's idea of a synthetic organism, perhaps what we can do is start cherry-picking the genes that we want which are important indeed in the infection process of the natural enemies that naturally parasitize nematodes. We can create a synthetic biocontrol agent or if you like, a designer biocontrol agent. And um, I want to leave you with that thought. Many of you will probably uh, be up in arms about it. Indeed, I was at a meeting where I mentioned this and got vilified for the thought of doing that. But these things are um, within our reach today. And I want to finish with a quote from my favorite poet, William Blake, who said that what is now proved was once only imagined. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'd like to thank those of you who've made it through to the end of this presentation. Uh, but um, if you want to actually delve into the literature uh, and uh, look at some of this work in much more detail, uh, there are a couple of slides coming up at the end with references on uh, and you can um, delve into it to your heart's content. Thank you very much.